All right, guys, good afternoon. It is afternoon, yes, it is. Um, very lucky to have a good friend of mine here today, a gentleman named James Landon from the University of Bath. Uh, James is an applied sports psychologist, obviously, with the university and with Team Bath, and uh, he's very kindly offered his time to have a quick chat today about um, motivation, resilience, and then a little bit of psychological adaptability. So thanks for coming along, James. That's all right. Thanks for having me along and uh, trusting me to hopefully give you something of interest. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Well, we, we have plenty of good conversations anyway, so I'm sure we can, uh, we can pass something on. So um, anyone who has kept track of the videos that I've done over the last couple of months, so we had uh, Carl Biscobi on very early on in the, in the lockdown process. And you, you work with Carl at the minute, don't you, James? Yeah, Carl's uh, currently completing some professional training as a sport and exercise psychologist. So um, I supervise part of Carl's work. So quite familiar with the uh, the session and the discussion that you had and, and watched it back a few times. So it was um, really informative. There were some, some great bits in there that hopefully some of the uh, the swimmers have been able to take away yeah. uh, and apply to their typical day-to-day -day or, or week-to-week -week regimes. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it seems from, from talking to everyone, obviously, if we've gone on that, they, they certainly have. And I think it was a good discussion just to have very quickly. Um, it's crazy to think that that was 14, 15 weeks ago now. <laughs> We're almost bookending this with the psychological part of it all. So, um, well, let's get diving into it then. So we'll talk a little about motivation to start with. And, uh, you know, obviously what we've all been going through recently, you know, you know, whether it's me, you, James, or, or the athletes out there, we're all going to have gone through this uh, this kind of undulating wave of motivation. Some days we'll be feeling it, some days we won't. We won't. And I mean, we've talked a lot about this before that it's a completely natural thing to feel. Um, you know, what what discussions have you had with athletes about motivation to kind of give them a little bit more context, or or even how would you normally go about that in in a general sense, and has it helped them during this whole process? I think you hit a nail on the head to start with. Everyone's motivation level goes up and down. Uh, it does normally, you know, in the uh, the pre-COVID world, our motivation to to train, to um, to throw ourselves into whatever it is that we're looking to pursue will go up and down naturally if we've got more things on at school, for example, academically, or we've got more things going on at work. Um, it's quite normal for that motivation level to go up and down. And we're ultimately in the post COVID. So since COVID's come in and the lockdown has come in, we're probably a little bit more aware of that because we've got more time, um, you know, to ourselves to think about the way we're thinking or recognize some of the ways we're thinking. So I would say in my work with a range of different athletes from student athlete level all the way through to Olympic level, motivation's a common topic that we talk about. And there have been evident dips in some of the athletes that I work, uh, work with and their motivation early on was pretty high, um, pretty consistent. And they were able to then transfer that into high effort and, you know, persisting in the face of adversity or approaching challenging targets or goals. And, and that dips and it, you know, rises again over that kind of 14, 15 week period. So in the last two or three weeks, I've had quite a few conversations with athletes of different sports, different levels that have ultimately said, look, I'm struggling a little bit motivationally and I feel like I need to, to help myself gain that drive, you know, to help me direct the behavior towards the kind of things that I want to look to do. So if any of your you know, people listening to this have, have experienced those dips in motivation. That's perfectly a normal part of being a human being. Mm. Uh, it's part of being an athlete. Um, does that make it any easier? No, but recognizing the fact that there's actually quite a lot of different people out there you can talk to about that hopefully might, might give some people some comfort from that side of knowing that ourselves as practitioners for me or coaches for yourself will have experienced very similar things. Absolutely. Um, and I suppose in, in how I'd go through and work or have worked with some of those athletes to help ultimately motivation um, is best represented on a, on a continuum from not being motivated through to being motivated for the pure love and enjoyment and feeling of doing something. Mm. So typically that's defined as that kind of intrinsic or internal motivation at that top end. So I'm, I'm involved in swimming because I love it. 
Uh, I get a lot of satisfaction from it. It's really enjoyable and um, it really feels like something I want to commit my actions and behaviors towards. Mm-hmm. Um, at the opposite end, no motivation is you wouldn't turn up, you wouldn't get to the pool because you're still on the sofa. You're not going. <laughs> you're, you're literally, you're not motivated to move. You will not get there. Mm. And then traditionally, so we've got no motivation this side, high motivation, intrinsic motivation this side. The thing in the middle, which sometimes people consider to be to be a less helpful view, motivation is that external reward. So um, I, I will go and you know take part in that swim meet because I can hit a time, or because I can demonstrate to someone that I'm faster than them, or because I you know get a medal or I get qualification to the next level, or uh, I get ten pounds per PB. Yeah, heard, yeah which hopefully before. doesn't happen too often. <laughs> I've, I've heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely when I was younger, that, 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 was a, that was a thing in the club I was at actually originally. Like it, um, it, was, it, was an old, it was an old one for me coming from a, a very um, working class background, I guess. You know, the, I think you know, the reward was you get to do this. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, 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 work and you, do, you go into school, you're doing your thing, you, you, your reward is being allowed to go and do this in the first place. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's been around in sport, I think, for a long time. You know, might be money, and it, it might be a new watch or whatever it is. And, it, you know, ultimately, people have different motivations in different settings. So it's not a bad thing to be motivated by wanting to hit a time or yeah. wanting to gain a medal or, you know, win a trophy or um, demonstrate that you're faster than other people. Yeah. The, ch- the challenge is if you're if your sport performance is very reliant on lots of targets that are all outcome related or all externally driven, Mm. that's where sometimes the love and enjoyment can be lost if those things aren't available. Mm. Um, And and for me, that's probably one of the areas that I've noticed with the athletes that I work with. A lot of them do have some elements of external drivers Mm. um, because they're, you know, competitive and they're talented and they, they, they like pitting themselves against other people. So when a situation like a global pen- pandemic kicks in, um, there aren't any competitions where you can judge your performance against something. So it's understandable that your motivation would dip a little bit because what you normally use to keep your motivation level high isn't available. So people put a lot of reliance on why aren't I enjoying this anymore? Why, why isn't you know, land-based training, even though I know it's helping my swimming, I'm, I'm not getting anything from it. I don't see the results. I don't see the feedback. And, the reality is in a, in a, you know, six months ago when people were, were, were back in the pool and swimming, you had a combination of those different motives. There were mm. some things that were personal drivers that you got quick feedback on. Mm. You, you had some external motives um, and they helped you direct your behavior. Mm. And, and ultimately, most of the stuff I've done with any of the athletes I've talked around motivation revolves around um, something called the three basic psychological needs, which are three things that every human being needs in order to enhance or help their motivation for any type of behavior. So you could use the same three needs in a, in a classroom, in the pool, in the gym, at work. Um, if it's when, you know, the parents are listening, for example, from that side and, and ultimately they're, they're considered to be three C's. So to keep someone's in, to help people become motivated for intrinsic reasons. So for enjoyment, for passion, for experience, I need to have a feeling of choice. Mm -hmm. So I need to feel like I have choice in what it is I'm doing. And that could be choice of the targets I'm setting myself or the choice of the activity I do. Uh, I've got to feel competent. So I've got to have a measure against how do I know I'm progressing or how do I know where I need to improve? And I need to feel connected to other people or to a thing bigger than just myself. So most of my conversations with athletes around motivation has ultimately pulled back to these basic psychological needs and says, look, in in your training, even if you land training only at the moment, how much connectedness are you getting? How much choice are you getting? And how how are you measuring your competence? Mm. And if every session you do has those three considerations, chances are you're going to be able to get that motivation level a little bit higher. Mm. I which think, in turn should help you persist and um, approach difficult goals or take on challenges and, and ultimately be able to put in more sustained effort. And I think there's some, there's some really kind of kind of key things there. I think obviously that out that um, the t- our team Bath AS guys have probably have been experiencing. And I think the first one I'll tap into is this that idea of that connectedness. You know, 
I think swimming, obviously, being a very individual sport, you kind of, you know, apart from relay events and things like that, or or uh, where we go and compete as a as a team specifically. Um, when you go to your, you know, whether it's the games, nationals, regional championships, whatever it is, you know, you are on your own generally. I think this is kind of where that individual sport, but having this team situation comes into it that even though we are competing for ourselves or for our own targets and all of that, having that team around us will always help us push forward better and more than we could on our own. Um, mm-hmm. uh, try, trying to think off the top of my head what the phrase is. It's, um, it's yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to remember it in a minute. It's something, it's something, something about going further as a group than you'll ever go as an individual, essentially. You know, when mm-hmm. you, it, it's, uh, I think it's along the lines of, on your own, you'll go faster, but as a group, you'll go further or something like that. Um, so you can save. I, I yeah. know I'm going to agree with you and say, yes, <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> there we go. I've got it. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think, you know, that, that, that's something that we definitely try to have, try to get people, you know, even though it's very different on the, you know, Zoom calls and things like that, trying to get people in sessions together and trying to get, you know, we've done quizzes just to try and keep people connected. And it is quite a very important part of it. But definitely you hit a nail on the head there for me talking about competition and it's probably going to ring very true to uh, you've got your delivery coming. One sec. Let's pause that. Yeah. All right. There we go. So James just grabbed his delivery. <laughs> we're, back, we're, we're back in the game. Um, so what, what was I saying? Yeah. So the, 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 idea, the, the no competition part, obviously, um, as a sport, we are definitely looking at probably not until January where we will have a a legitimate opportunity to really go and compete and like you say you kind of give ourselves those competition markers to utilize mm-hmm. um i mean it, it, there's probably a lot of different levels of advice that you, you could kind of pass on when it comes to this motivation side of this but is there any like simple little things that you could just pass on to our athletes as to how they could keep themselves in check as they go through there like what little strategies would you generally, could you recommend to get them just to think about from day to day or from week to week just to give themselves those little check markers as they go along when they don't have the competition? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the easiest thing to kind of suggest really is, is knowing that if you, if you look after those three C's, so um, consider, you know, if let's say I've woken up in the morning, I've... Um, had a shower, I've had my breakfast, I'm thinking about what my training session is ahead of the day. I might start off, divide a piece of paper into three and say, right, what choices am I going to make today that's going to help me to become a better athlete or a better person or a better swimmer? Um, How am I going to measure whether or not today's been a good session or today's been a good day? So that competence measure. And then ultimately in the connectedness column, it's a case of saying, how could I do this with someone else? Whether that's mum, whether that's dad, brother, sister, dog, other, other, um, <laughs> you know, other swimmer, it's a case of saying, how can I, how can I get someone else involved in that? And that could be something quite simple, like, you know, um, sending a, a WhatsApp message to, to a friend saying, this is how long I held this specific hold in my training session today. This is mm. how many seconds I was managed to hold this position, or this is how long um, I spent foam rolling today. Something that gives a specific, you know, swimming related possibly measure, but then also says to someone else, like, I'm also spending time developing that part of my performance. Like, how are you working on yours? So you're mm. facilitating that discussion. It doesn't have to turn into a competition. It's a case of saying, like, how can we help each other maybe through the bits that aren't, you know, people might not have got into swimming because they have a, a definitive love of pre-pool exercises. I'm, I'm sorry if that <laughs> isn't the case, but... That, 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 might, that might get the S&C a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit upset. <laughs> but what, what I'm saying is that there's, there's going to be elements, obviously, now that people can work on that... <clears throat> they haven't had the opportunity to dive into in as much detail. Mm. So starting off quite simply and saying, does my practice session today or does my day to day routine include elements of choice and competence and connectedness? Cause if it doesn't, that's okay. It may just help to explain why you're not necessarily feeling too motivated to do other things. Mm. Um, and it does, you know, what I've said to a lot of the athletes I've worked with is think a little broader than just your sport. So 
there will be something you're doing day to day that you're motivated to do. Mm. So rather than ignore that and say, well, why can't I take that level of motivation into my swim training? It's, it's learn from the thing that you are motivated to do and say, well, what, what are the tender, the um, characteristics of this? Why do I find that so appealing to do or so easy to do? Mm. Or why am I so driven to do that? And, and use that experience to learn more about what motivates you because you don't have to have motivation in order to act or behave in a certain way. Mm. So having, not having, not feeling motivated is not a bad thing. It's a, it's a human experience. The challenge is you can still do something with a lower level of motivation. It, it just might feel almost like I have to wait till I'm motivated before I can train. And the reality is I, I could train without the motivation. It might not necessarily be my best session, but when I'm in it, then can I try and focus on those, uh, those quality markers maybe that I'm experiencing mm. throughout the session? Well, the, the way I've heard that kind of principle described before, it's e even on your, even your tough days where you're not, you, you're not quite feeling it. It might feel a bit uncomfortable, um, but you're essentially building compound interest, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. You know, you, you are, you, you're providing something to, towards that target that you've set for yourself or wait, the direction you're moving in. It may not be as awesome as it was the day before or in a week's time or whatever it is, but it's something that is building towards that. In worst case scenario, you've maintained, which is, yeah. which is absolutely fine as well. You know, as long it's, a, it's, a, it's a goal that many, many athletes really, really want. They want to maintain the level they're at. And I mean, hmm. no, from, from our discussions that we've had over the last few years, like the, the, the book Atomic Habits um, that I know you've read and I've read going through, which talks about habit formation. One of the most powerful, important things that that book suggests is the concept of, of, of a habit tracker. And when you're talking about motivation, there is no simpler tool out there to, to get your motivation levels slightly higher than a habit tracker. So ticking off when you've done things. Mm. Um, that could be foam rolling exercises for the day. It could be making sure you're taking time out to prep your meal for the day. It could be making sure you're taking time out to take the dog for a walk or to get outside and enjoy some, some time out in, in the fresh air and in green space ticking it off on that process on a, on a habit tracker. And for those not familiar, if you were to Google James clear habit tracker, there's a downloadable um, PDF file you can use. It's very simple. Uh, and it's just a, every day I do that habit, I tick it off. And why it's so powerful is because that ticks the competence box that I was talking about earlier. I see that and I think I did it three days in a row. So I'm just going to keep that streak going. Yeah. And, and that is a powerful, um, a powerful tool because we like to feel good about what it is we're doing. Mm. And it becomes, it's almost like an inner competition that you create when yeah. you're, you're ticking that off as you go. Because I, I, I use the same principle, um, the things that I do, and it, be, it becomes very frustrating if you're almost at, the, at a point in a day where you're like, oh, I haven't done that yet. I've got to get it done because <laughs> I don't want to break that streak. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. there's, an, there's another author... Um, that, that I follow um, a guy called Alan Stein, who wrote a book called Raise, Raise, raising the game. Um, and he tweets almost all every day about how his meditation tracking that he does. And I think yesterday it was something like he's done like a thousand and something meditation days straight, which was, it's quite mind boggling to think that he's gone for years with doing that without stopping, but he must be at the stage now where there's no way he can break that. It's, it's probably automatic now he's got to that stage i mean for me i um from working with a few athletes a few years ago did quite a lot of uh, meditation using headspace like i've started using headspace because i wanted to learn more about what benefits those athletes were getting from it and i think i i'm 209 days into my streak and i have exactly that feeling yeah. i've got i've got a habit now where at a certain time of day i'm like right it's time time to to wind down a little bit and spend a little bit of time kind of clearing your mind and, and, and refocusing. Um, so, and, and I feel quite, you know, passionate about making sure I can get to 365 days because that's the target I set myself to see what happens. Well, it tells you what it is, isn't it? it, the, it the, the street count, because I think I'm on, I'm on 60 something at the minute. Um, it's, it is addictive. <laughs> it, it is, it is, is it? But it's, that's, that's where a lot of, you know, it's going a bit off piece, but a lot of mobile phone apps, a lot of design work in and around technology are based upon 
basic motivational uh, feedback and systems. Mm. So it feels good because you get that little dopamine kick and you, you get a biological reaction that happens in the brain that says, this makes me feel good, so I want to do it again. Well, things like F- Facebook built on it. Yeah. You've, got, you've got the choice of who you can follow or who can follow you. You got you know the confidence measure of you can get likes and comments yeah. and all of that, and then you got the connected connective part, and it kind of ticks all of those. I mean, it's no wonder that we spend. It's like I mean, video games. I love video games. There's a reason that people play them so frequently and they're so pretty much addicted to it. It's got that. It's just got that all of those components as part of it. You know, yeah. even if it's not online or whatever it is, you know, you can connect with other people about the game that you're playing. It's. Uh, you're exactly right. A lot of marketing is built on it as well. Yep. <laughs> yeah. very, it can be very clever. <laughs> there's the, the, you know, scratch the surface, there's quite a lot of psychological principles that inform many, many walks of life that I don't necessarily think we're as aware of that we, as aware of as we could be. From that absolutely. Side. Absolutely. It can be used in a very good way and obviously in negative ways too, <laughs> in, some, in some respects. So, so yeah, well, I mean, let's kind of move forward a little bit then. So, after talking a little bit about motivation, let's look a little bit into resilience. Now, I mean, I know from, from, you know, from growing up when I did and, and, and through many years of sport for myself that resilience was almost kind of seen as this, um, you just got to toughen up kind of thing, you know, or, you know, you've had a bit of a hard time, toughen up, you'll be fine or get, get back on the horse. It's all good. And, but there's so much more around resilience and how it is built and how, I mean, this is just kind of my perspective on it, that I, I feel like everyone has a has massive, massive levels of resilience inside them already. And I kind of use the, the, the idea of it's just about how you learn how to unlock that and how you learn how to become self-aware enough to know where you sit on a continuum of where I'm, you know, what can I actually do about this situation or can I do something about it or can I not, if that makes sense. So uh, what, what's, what's your take on, on how you focus on resilience and, and talking to athletes about that? I think it's one of the most popular, dare I say, buzzwords of the last five, 10 years in terms of sports mm. psychology research. It maybe 15, 20 years ago, we talked about mental toughness and that mm. kind of similar, I suppose, to that perception you mentioned there of um, the analogy a lot of people tend to refer to is that kind of that suit of armor that you put mm. on and if you have the suit of armor, you're, you're going to be able to deal with anything that's thrown at you. Um, and it's not really an accurate, you know, analogy for resilience. One, because resilience is, uh, it's using your personal qualities to be able to withstand pressure. Mm. So let's take the suit of um, armor analogy. It assumes that I've got to go and get something, put it on, and then I'm fine. So once I've got it, I've always got it but that isn't necessarily how resilience tends to work. Now, resilience is, is context specific. And what I mean by that is your level of resilience might be different when you're in and around a swimming environment as you when you are at school, mm. or if you're in um, you know, a coaching session versus if you are spending time uh, on some form of course, or whether you are at work or whether you're at home. So the, it's, it's ultimately the, the personal qualities that someone possesses and their ability to help them deal with pressure so ultimately that gives you a couple of really different things that you can consider the first being i could rather than look for the end goal of i want to be resilient is actually spending a bit of time working on those psychological factors that do help you become a little bit more aware and a little bit more in control of the way it is you're thinking Hmm. so it's quite a nice link really with what we talked about earlier. Cause one of, one of the psychological factors that um, researchers quite prominent in the area consider to underpin resilience is motivation mm. coupled with, you know, um, uh, an athlete's ability to maintain their focus, to perceive the support that they have around them, mm. their level of confidence and a number of what, you know, researchers tend to consider positive personality traits. So being open or being agreeable, um, those factors, those five factors. So personality, motivation, focus, confidence, and support or perceived support 
they are the factors that then influence how an individual responds to to a stress or or to a to a pressurized situation so rather than view resilience as something people either have or haven't got mm. it's a case of saying actually how do i build my personal qualities mm. the ultimately end goal is i'll be able to withstand more pressure rather than what you know the the common belief is that i need to rush to the end i need to get resilient because then i can deal with stuff mm. better i can deal with the fact that we don't know when competition's coming next or I can deal with the fact that I've got a less than ideal training regime. If you were to flip it on its head, you actually say, well, let's, let's start working. Can you better understand your personality, help understand what motivates you, figure out what drives your confidence, mm. understand where you really, you know, work well when you're focusing on certain aspects of your performance and then sit down and say, well, you know, what, what social support do I have around me? How well supported do I feel? Those five factors are going to support your ability to be more resilient in the long run. Mm. So, for, you know, for anyone kind of listening in or watching in from that side, it's really a case of saying actually that's the key to becoming more resilient. It's understanding those personal qualities, and then considering that those personal qualities and they, they may be slightly different in different environments. But rather than set out to get resilient and then I can go and do stuff, I can go and. Um, throw myself in pressurized situations or compete under a little bit more stress than normal or, you know, perform optimally more often. It's a case of saying actually spend some time working on those personal qualities mm. and those personal qualities, they interact with the environment that we're in, you know, so if the environment we're in has an effective blend of being challenging, but supportive, then we're more likely to develop an optimal level of performance. Mm. Um, it's also linked to our ability to um, to view a situation as a challenge rather than as a threat. Mm. If, if we can appraise a situation as a challenge, um, we know from lots of research across countless different performers in lots of different domains that if we view something as a challenge, biologically, there's something different that happens to our body that enables our um, our blood vessels to open up and to get more oxygen, to get more um to more, more energy around our system a lot faster so that mm. viewing a situation as a challenge has a biological influence on how we can actually perform more maximally mm. um so this combination of personal qualities the uh, the challenge mindset and the environment we find ourselves in ultimately are how uh, researchers and practitioners encourage high level athletes talent level athletes student athletes to develop their levels of resilience by considering that it's actually there's multiple factors at play rather than just get that suit of armor put it on and, yeah. and go and face the world yeah absolutely it's i mean we, we we kind of briefly touched on this before we started um recording this video that you know, you know psychology is one of those things where it's so powerful understanding how the mind works or more, more importantly, I would say how your mind works is such an under underutilized part of sport. Um, it's, uh, we, we, you know, we, it's not the most, um, it's not the coolest thing, you know, psychology, I think psychology has always been looked at as it's not the cool thing on the block, you know, you know, going and doing your, your, your training, hard training sessions is, is the cool bit and, or going and racing and kind of having all of this challenge around you is all great. But, you know, the psychology part, it's such an important factor and kind of j just just from what you've said, James, kind of an overarching theme to understanding what motivation is and how it works for you and, and resilience on that side, too. You know, you've mentioned the environment and I would add in the, the importance of the environment you're in. That, like I said, it's challenging, but it's supportive. It's got like minded people. I think that's quite an important factor as well, but also we talked a little bit about this idea of self-awareness. So mm -hmm. the environment you went, you're in and you being more aware of how your mind works and how you need to do certain things. If you can kind of open yourself up to those environments and have that awareness of self starting to delve into what resilience and motivation looks like for you personally, seems to me like it would just be a lot more of a, a lot more smooth process. If that makes sense. Um, 
It'd be interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we've all been in, in environments where things have been very closed off and it's very difficult to, to break out into this, into that challenge mindset that you described. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes the challenge with say motivation and resilience and, you know, I'd, I'd throw a lot of different psychological terms in there, whether it's, you know, confidence or nervousness, anxiety, there's a little bit of a belief that I have to feel some of those things to perform my best, i.e. I have to feel confident to, to swim well, or I have to feel no anxiety to swim well. When the mind isn't as clear cut as that, we can't switch things on and off. Sometimes thoughts come and go. Sometimes they hang around. Um, sometimes we, we, we hold on and, and, uh, a thought might hook us and it stays with us for a while. And we, we fight it a little bit by thinking, you know, don't think about the fact you're nervous because you're on the blocks. And I know nervousness is a bad thing. So stop thinking nervously. Um, and then you'll perform better. And all of a sudden, many, many athletes, whether they're youth athletes, professional athletes, it will happen to people at work. They, they get caught in a trap of thinking about the way they're thinking. And ironically, <laughs> that means they can't perform at their best because their energy and effort, their attention isn't on what they're trying to do. It's almost this negative feedback loop, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, if if I stand if I stand on a block thinking you haven't done this for a while, and I'm feeling a little bit nervous, that's taking me back to a, a past performance of the last time I did it, maybe, or thinking about a desired future that hasn't happened yet. Mm. The one thing we know about that is that whether I look back or wherever I look forward, it's taking me away from my focus on the present. Mm. And if it takes me away from my focus on the present. I'm going to have a challenge getting off that block in a technically accurate, quick, powerful, fast manner because my attention's elsewhere. Mm. And, and I really, the only thing I need to do in that situation is to get off the block quickly because that's going to help me. <laughs> and, and my it's, mind is taking me to places that won't. And that's, and that's funny. It's got me thinking, tapping into what we talked briefly before again about the, the last dance, the, the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan documentary um, about you know, <laughs> had we watched it, <laughs> obviously we both have. And there's a quote in there and there's a moment where Michael Jordan talks about why would I worry about a shot that I haven't taken yet? And I thought that was a really powerful statement that he's talking about being present and being mindful about where he is in the moment. And um, it, it was just a, a great kind of thing to see someone of such a high level go, well, I don't worry about the future. I work hard at doing what I need to do when I'm aware of myself. And if I take a bad shot, I take a bad shot. I move forward. And I think, I think the really nice thing sometimes to remind yourself, especially take for the swimmers that are going to be watching this, every length that you swim is for the first time. You haven't done it before. Your next competition, your next event is for the first time. And if you can remind yourself of that, while you're just pushing off the wall or you're just diving in, uh, getting off the blocks or <clears throat> you've just completed your tumble turn you can very much focus on what do i need to do right now to get me to that small little goal that i want so how do i get to the other end of the pool in this time or this many strokes or um feeling this way physiologically and i think just having that little anchor of of thinking do you know what this is for the first time yes i know i, I can guess what's going to happen because i've been here before mm. i don't actually know i don't know how hard i can push myself here because this is the first time I'm experiencing it. And that for me was one of those really interesting things in that documentary is that yeah. Jordan obviously was the centerpiece of the focus of that documentary. But a lot of the other players, coaches, staff in and around there seemed to share some of those, those views that what they were doing, they needed to be fully here and there in the, in the present moment in order to perform at their best. Mm which is really hard to do because the human brain wants us to think about what's happened before to mm. help us predict what's going to happen next. Yeah. That's how it works. That's how you learn. That's how we're taught to learn. Well, it's a prediction machine, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's a I'm really good way to it. It's very good at it. You know, your brain quite, quite annoyingly wants to be really energy efficient, which ultimately means it can be quite, it wants to be quite lazy. It doesn't want you to think too hard about what it is you're going to do. So that's why people develop habits. Mm. And that's why you do things automatically because it's energy efficient. Mm. Um, it's funny that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've all naturally got lazy brains. 
<laughs> well, it, it, to a certain extent, to a certain extent, it wants to be energy efficient. So it means yeah. that, um, you know, it's it's better to use what we know about what happened before to predict what's going to happen now rather than focus right now on, well, what do I need to do? Because that's a new thought that requires more effort and energy. Absolutely. So ultimately in sport, without downplaying, you know, too much of the other areas that are covered in psychology at a lot of the time is what it comes down to. It's can you find yourself in a position, whether that's thinking about specific things you want to achieve or an absence of thought that ultimately helps you deliver the performance you want. So in many cases, it's not a, a new, you know, shiny strategy. You've got to pick off a shelf or get out of a book and say, I'm going to do this. It may well just be taking a step back, getting a bit of space and giving yourself that little bit of awareness you were talking about that helps you then get to that. Yeah. and we, we've we've talked i mean we talked about this again beforehand that you know so many things in psychology in theory are easy to do yeah but then in practice doing them consistently and, and doing them when it matters and when sometimes the pressure's on it's that's where the challenge comes into it so i think that's a, it's a pretty good kind of segue i guess to kind of jump in a little bit i know you wanted to kind of touch on the idea of psychological adaptability so we could probably use that as a little platform to jump in. So, you know, um, from your perspective, kind of what are the things there that um, are most important to pass on about that? Yeah, I mean, it, just to, to kind of give some some background to that, the reason why I suggested to, to Carissa just to guide that conversation is, is ultimately if, if you're listening to this having never looked at psychology before and then you Google psychology, there's lots of different skills you can choose and, and find information about to work on. The, the one that I would say is going to be the best for you in wider life away from the pool that will also help you in the pool and in your land-based training, et cetera, is, is psychological flexibility. So it's your ability to, to recognize the situation you're in and change your mindset to ultimately ensure that you're, you're helping yourself in that situation. You're moving towards behaviors, whether that's, times or placings or stroke count or um qualification for certain competitions you're moving towards something that's meaningful and important to you mm. um, rather than being motivated to try and to move away from something mm. so you know if, if i'm if i'm racing someone and we we we're head to head final turn i've got 50 meters to go it's the ideal situation you want to be is I'm motivated to swim hard in that final 50 meters because there's something that's important to me that I'm chasing after rather than I'm only trying to get there quick because I, I want to avoid coming second to you. Mm. So it's moving towards things that are meaningful. So psychological flexibility or adaptability is, is one of the most important psychological skills that will support you in a ever changing, ever dynamic and uncertain world. And that unfortunately has been our experience for the last 16, 17 weeks. So therefore this is a skill that um, can be quite impactful, or very impactful. Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately how you do that, because it's, like, it's a great sounding thing of saying, I want to be flexible in my thinking. Ultimately there's, there's three things you do. You want to be present. So that, ultimately is trying to be in the here and now with a strengthened level of awareness of how you're thinking and how you're feeling. You want to be able to try and open up. So be able to accept those inner thoughts and feelings without being hooked by them. So without paying too much attention or being taken away and thinking about something that's, that's unhelpful. So notice that you can learn from some of those thoughts and feelings and they do pass. Mm -hmm. And then the third element ultimately is to do what matters. So to commit action towards something that you value. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you swim because of the, the friendship element, the, um, the teamwork element, the fact that you can push yourself to work hard, you can achieve it's, it's working towards behaviors and actions that are helping you move towards your values not goals values so how you want to go about living or working or training as a swimmer or as a person yeah. from that side so the ability ultimately to to work on these three things so to be present to open up and to do what matters they are 
um, a series of skills you can work on that enhance your ability to be psychologically flexible. And I think you, you, you've, you've, you've already said it and I'll, I'll kind of reinforce, you know, one of the key points I think with that, with those three ideas that it is a skill for life and it's something that, you know, as someone who's competed before and gone on to, you know, to, to, to university and to, and into work and all of the, in all sorts of different situations, you know, though that I, you know, being flexible with the thinking is, it's such a, you don't always think about it, but you don't really think about it that much, but being able to do it opens things up so much more to, I think it's, it stops you dwelling on things that are very easy to get caught up in. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, it, it almost, it almost maybe links in for me that the idea of you're controlling the things that you can like manage what you can don't worry about the things that you have absolutely no power over because you know, you're just going to get caught again, caught in this kind of feedback loop of thinking that's very, very unconstructive and not really taking you anywhere. I think you raise, you know, raise a really interesting point there relative to the situation we're in. So no one, no one shows for the COVID scenario to, to, you know, to happen. Mm. They didn't choose for the impact that it's had to your, your swimming training. But with a, if you've got a, self, a level, a good level of self-awareness, you can choose how you react to the situation we're in now. Mm. You know, just <laughs> like you are there. You, know, you can choose for this reaction. Choose, no, sorry, choose for reaction to this situation. Yeah, to let the dog slobber on me. <laughs> yeah. You just want attention, don't you, Bella? <laughs> she's, just, she's probably just been outside digging in the, in the flower garden. So she's probably uh, trying to get trying to button me up before I see it. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. A little bit of deception. Absolutely. But yeah. And you know, ultimately it's, it, it's hard. It's not necessarily easy to say you can choose how you react to lots of situations, but if you've got that self-awareness um, or work on that self-awareness, sorry, you're, you're going to be more aware of the choices you have, which means that you actually will feel like there's a choice. So mm-hmm. for, you know, until, until swimming pools are deemed um, to, to be opened from that side, that's a situation that not many people um, internationally can control. So therefore it's a case of saying, right, what, what choices do I have? How can I choose to think following that situation? Mm. If you can step back a little bit from it, look at it and say, right, it's not ideal. It's not what I want, but I can still learn something from this scenario. What is there to be learned about me, about the sport, about what else it is I can do? you're more likely to be able to become aware of what those choices are. Mm. And if you're aware of what the choices are, aware that you have choices, you're going to feel much more comfortable when you come to the choice that you do make, because you feel like you've considered Absolutely. those actions, your approach. Um, and again, it's, you know, you hit the nail on the head. I wasn't not offended when you said psychology is, it's not the, the, the shiny uh, training aid that, <laughs> that some other areas are. And then in some respects, some of the concepts are quite, quite simple principles, but they're, they're hard to do because we don't necessarily get instant feedback. And sometimes we are, um, we're solely accountable to ourselves. Like you don't know what I'm thinking. So therefore I need to make sure that I'm holding myself accountable for what it is I'm thinking and how I'm acting. So that, that can be yeah. difficult because you can't see it. Yeah. You um, can't see it. And it, it, it can also be a difficult moment when you first realize it that actually we are fully in control of what we say think and do you know there are certain things that happen in our brains that are automatic like so that, those are kind of, those tend to be the habits or the natural re- responses we have to things but you, know, you talked about how you react to things i kind of look at that as when something happens to you you've got the choice of either am i going to react to it in this really quick unthoughtful way or am i going to have a response for it am i going to stop myself go right what's going on how can i get my get myself centered again and thinking in the in the way i want to and then how can i move forward with this now it could be a really challenging situation where you know you get you get your your fight your flight your freeze kind of things going on but Mm -hmm. even in those scenarios you can still slow yourself down and go right what's going on here how can i move forward with this how can i get something from it um, and it's all, I think, especially when you're talking about, you know, when I, when I say there's a, there's a choice to be made, you, you can't necessarily choose what you're going to, what you're going to think. Like if I, you know, I'll walk out into the street and down the road near my house, I might see 
see something that I pass or, you know, see a change in the weather or see, you know, a situation that arises with someone crossing the road or, you know, mm. traffic jam or whatnot. And my thoughts are then a reaction to what it is I'm looking to see. So I can't necessarily yeah. control what I'm thinking, yeah. but I can, I can choose to view those thoughts as something that pass or mm. view those things as something that's quite temporary rather than saying that this is a fixed rigid thing that's going to be with me for the entire day. Right. And so when we're talking about, that those kind of becoming flexible one of the most important steps really you can look at is, is just get a bit curious about how often you know thoughts might come in and might disappear out of your mind they come and go mm. they're not logical and structured the, the the previous view of thinking a little bit like a computer if i input this thought i get this out mm. is, is a little bit dated and, and it it's not the brain's a lot more complex than that yeah so you know, there are no right or wrong ways to think. Everyone thinks in their own individual way. And the challenge is you've got to try and find a way to, to best relate to the way you think. Noticing what thoughts are helpful, what thoughts are unhelpful is a really good starting point. Mm. Um, And the situation we're in at the moment, spending time thinking, I wish I was in the pool is very normal, Mm. but it might not necessarily be the most helpful now. If you only leave it with, I wish I was in the pool. Yeah. I really wish I was in the pool today. If you look at it and go, well, what does that tell me about myself? That tells me I really value swimming. Do I like the feel of the water? Do I like the, the physical exertion of training? Do I like the people I'm with? If you go in a little bit deeper and understand that thought specifically, you're going to be able to be curious and learn more about what those, those thoughts, those beliefs might tell you about yourself. Mm. So, so it essentially it allows you to take that, next step down to your thinking about why you truly value it but then you can almost finish off that sentence with yeah i can't be in the pool right now but i can do this or i can do these things to make sure that when the time does come i'm prepared for it and when i'm ready definitely and and and, you know that for me would making some assumptions that might be quite a common common thought for for swimmers all over the country and all over the world thinking i really wish i was able to get in the pool Mm. and at the very very least that should tell you that swimming is important to you Mm. and that 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 sometimes can be quite a comfort of going actually do you know what the reason why i want to be back in the pool is because this is a really important part of my life an important part of what i do Mm. and that's absolutely fine make sure you spend the time to understand well, what, what, do, why does that become important to you? What does it offer you? What do you get out of that? How do you know it's something that's really important to you mm. rather than just getting stuck, which could happen in the loop of, well, I just want to be back swimming. I just, if I get back swimming, then I'll be happier or then I'll be more confident or then I'll feel, um, you know, a little less stressed from that side. It's a case of actually just until that day does come, it's a case saying, well, let's understand that if it's important to you understanding how why and um or how and why sorry would be a really good idea because it then ultimately can help you notice when you're going to be more motivated or gives you that little bit of an insight as to the steps that you've probably already taken in 15 weeks that demonstrate that you have a high level of resilience Mm, absolutely i mean uh, this is most likely definitely made people realize that they've got more inside them than they've, they've thought they had before. And I mean, just to kind of, it's slightly, slightly, you know, it's slightly kind of um, just something that I've experienced and it's something I feel, but I think how grateful I think we will all be to be able to get back into that environment and to see it as this amazing opportunity that we, you know, we get to do this. And I think, I think that, that, you know, you've talked about, making that choice in your mind about viewing something as a challenge rather than as a threat. You know, I think there's also that element of, you know, I get to do this rather than I have to do this. Mm. That makes sense. It's, it's, it's almost like that positive affirmation that, that you're giving yourself to go, well, this is something I, I am able to do. This is an opportunity. This is something for me that I really love. Um, and I know for me personally, when we get back, I'll be so grateful. And I don't think there'll be a day goes by for the rest of my career where, I'm not grateful that we're able to go and and just do do the things that we love. And for me, that's teaching. You know, being able to go in and, and to teach people how to race fast and and how to generate the skills that they need to do that, and then hopefully transfer them forward in life. You know, it's going to be it's going to be fantastic. So, um, 
you know, if, if I can kind of, I guess, so, some, some kind of some of the key points up here and please um, add anything in if, I, if you feel like I've missed anything specific. So just kind of nipping back to the motivational part, I think we talked about having a really positive and, and, and great environment is an important factor of being motivated and obviously having strong resilience and building it. You know, having that environment, being self-aware of, of who you are and how you respond to things is such an important factor. When it comes to motivation, having the three C's, the choice, the the competence markers, and um, having that the people around you. I think you, you, you described it as um, uh, uh, connectedness. Connectedness. <laughs> I couldn't even yeah. write my, read my own writing there. <laughs> connectedness. There we go. Connectedness, so, yeah. So you've got those three C's in terms of you know, the resilience. But if I can kind of try and sum that up, it's, 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 it's so much about building personal qualities. Um, you know, if you can focus on that, then you're going to build resilience naturally by focusing not necessarily on it directly. Um, and then you talked about psychological flexibility, three kind of key points to that being, being present, opening yourself up and doing what matters. And I think there's some really simple, I mean, we just said it already, there's some really easy and simple things to consider when you look at, am I being, um, how can I help myself be motivated? How can I help my resilience? How can I build up that flexibility? Those are some really good little tools, I think. Um, mm -hmm. and I think ho hopefully if everyone's got this far, the, we'll all be we'll all very appreciative that you've taken the time to, to talk about that. That's okay, anytime. Awesome. Well, so guys, hopefully you've got this far through the video and um, thank you, James, for, for talking to me about this. And you know, James is always around the SDV when it gets opened up again, whenever that's going to be, um, <laughs> whatever it's going to look like. But um, me and James have known each other for a long time. If any, if anyone's got any questions that they would like me to pose, I'm, I'm sure if I dropped you a question or two, then um, you, James would get back to me and, and fill in the gaps there. Um, yeah, no brilliant. And hopefully you've got something from this guy. So we'll leave that there again. Thank you very much, James. Cool. Thank you. Stay right. safe. Yeah, we will do. See you later.